Andre G. wrote in with a question that touched on two different subjects, the Long Now Foundation in California and the idea of a future that we look upon in long, long, long-term formats. Essentially, what do I think about them? What do they mean? What can we do to prepare for a long-term view of what we have now? And I Thank Andre for thinking of me, and I hope he'll appreciate that my answers are very, very dark. This is Jason Scott Talks His Way Out of It, a podcast about technology, history, and getting myself out of debt. Thanks to Peter Healy, Daniel Boyd, and the hundreds of other supporters on Patreon and elsewhere who have been supporting me and helping me get out of debt. The Long Now Foundation is endearingly comfy. As a disclosure, I was invited to come speak at the Interval, which is the coffee house and bar run by the Long Now Foundation at their offices, where I gave a talk about emulation and preservation and what it all meant, and I had a fantastic time. Also, as a disclosure, they make a fantastic set of non-alcoholic drinks, including one that is my true favorite. And while I've paid for every one of them, I guess I can say I got some influence at how great they are by how wonderful those drinks taste. The fundamental project that most people hear about when they hear about the Long Now Foundation is a clock that will run for 10,000 years in the desert, ticking at very, very long intervals with the idea of representing the potential of what the human race could be if it just spent more time truly looking forward and taking the future into account. This is absolutely freaking adorable. The clock itself, as it's being designed, is very hard to interpret from a contemporary standpoint. It is being built with materials that should last for 10,000 years. The mechanism has to be taken into account. The idea of building any machinery that lasts longer than most measurements of human civilization is breathtakingly optimistic. But that's kind of the point. It's less about the metal machine being put together and more about the idea of what it represents. Even if it falls apart after 50 or 100 years and people go to it with the equivalent of a, well, they tried, the idea is to inspire us, just like most moonshots and large-scale projects are meant to, where we'll think of the world differently than we do now and maybe the thinking goes, be less jerks about how we are now. Projects like working on a church for 500 years where people would labor building struts for roofs they would never see in their lifetimes is, depending on your point of view, either a wonderful investment in your belief in the future of humanity or, cynically, a job you'll never have to worry about losing. Maybe this has been covered in previous episodes, or maybe you've inferred it, but I have a very low general opinion of how we, the species of humanity, conduct things. If that sounds bizarre, considering the type of work I do, well, maybe that represents a sort of optimism in itself. I so happily jump out of a virtual airplane in a battle royale game, facing off against 99 other people, many of whom are many times better than me, with the hope built in that at the end of the game 20 minutes later, it'll be me who's the winner. Maybe there's something to be said for how I conduct myself with everything. I've watched faces fall when I go into my metaphor about humanity, which is whenever I see humanity doing something wonderful, insightful, beautiful. I usually think of it like a tiger at a tea party. If you bring a tiger to the tea party and the tiger does 
what most tigers do. That's not very surprising. But if the tiger picks up a teacup and begins sipping from it gently and enjoying the music and quietly eating the little cakes, well, that's a wonder to behold. And if you have to bring a lot of tigers to a lot of tea parties to see that sight, maybe it's worth it. Maybe it's worth it in the outside chance that it happens. Luckily, the ratio of tigers to tea parties in the human world is better. I've encountered so many people who have explained the worthlessness of the things I do or indicated that archiving this particular information or that particular media is a quote-unquote waste of time. Or the zero-sum game people like to play, which indicates that scanning this material means a direct decision not to scan other material. That's the status quo. But then many, many other times I have people who write me to tell me that some obscure piece of work that came through or some odd, scanned, ephemeral information made the difference between happiness and sadness in one of their quests. The amount of fan mail that my different projects and the projects I align with get is actually pretty inspiring. Folks take the time when something so special happens, like being able to have a long-standing query come to life. A really good example was a programmer who, in high school, worked for a few months on an adventure game that he gave to a cousin, and the cousin uploaded it to one BBS, where it was scooped up by some shareware shovelware company, and it ended up there, and then that CD eventually ended up in the CD-ROM section on the Internet Archive, where a streamer looking for fun, weird, odd games to stream happened to select that one, put it up, and said, this is actually rather amazing. And the creator, the game developer, discovered his game, which he had completely forgotten he had given to anybody, playing the subject for this streamer's channel. Imagine the surreality of that experience. For all of the shovelware CDs that we've archived, for all of the obscure file sections that have been turned into large zips and distributed, only a few times will we see something that magical. But it did happen. The tiger came to the tea party. I walk into rooms of despair and loss. Just recently, I took on a whole range of music manuals that came from New York City. And the story behind it was that one audio company, losing its lease, partnered up with another to use some of their space in the back, but then went out of business. And that second company, needing the space back, was going to throw it all out, except somebody affiliated with them remembered me and the Internet Archive and wrote me and said, would you possibly come and take it. And I reached out and I found a volunteer named Adrian who was able to drive from nearby my house, go down to New York City multiple times and take in 15 extremely large boxes of full ranges of schematics, manuals, and information updates about a whole range of synthesizers, microphone, and audio amplifiers that would have been completely lost. As I opened these boxes, they were set up for a company, for individuals over the course of decades to be able to service all sorts of equipment. They were service bulletin updates put into small manila folders, put into small boxes listed by manufacturer, and there for somebody to be able to walk over to grab and do the work they needed. And all of that system, all of the way it had been put together, was essentially now for naught. At best, after finding out what isn't already online and setting up resources to scan them, I'm going to be scanning them into a world that doesn't ultimately care what was next to each other. It doesn't matter what their internal system was because I can't find it. The closest I can do is sort by manufacturer, place it all online, and make it searchable. 
years of effort of keeping them straight and building a system that made sense to that person will fall away like waves on a shore and be replaced with a monolith of information that I'm going to help create. Lost also, unless I can find out from the people who gave this to me, is the story of the person or persons who built this company, who put it together, who tried to do their job as efficiently as they could and built a library, honestly a library, out of all this information for their own values and reference. While I may in some ways replace it with a library that is universally available to many more people, something had to die for this to live. It's a quote that slipped out of me during one conversation, and I've used it here and there at various junctures to various levels of success, but I stand by it, which is that life is a lossy format. Entropy, changed priorities, these shift and come into play constantly. We live in a world that destroys things if they're not maintained, that takes things away even when they're static. Sometimes it's an artifact. Other times it's a way of thinking, a society, a network, a social graph that falls apart with the passage of time. Sometimes a network that wasn't obvious at the time comes out later with advances in processing and being able to forego the political and personal boundaries that stop those connections from being made. But in the aggregate, we lose more than we keep. More of it goes out the door. For every time that I tell the great story of picking up this from being trashed or this other part from being lost, there's many more with nobody to observe, no photos to inspire, and no chapter written that just ends with it being gone. And here's the thing. While from there you can possibly read a cynicism, a loss, a lack of faith in what we're able to do with our heritage, our knowledge, our learning, our lore. I hold out nothing but hopefulness in everything I do. I will endlessly, as long as I live, leave things for others to enjoy, to make use of. Perhaps the biggest missing piece to something like the Long Now Foundation is that even though they're building a 10,000-year clock, they're maintaining a bar, a coffee house, an office, and events for now. People have been sharing ideas as we speak, parties and get-togethers and meetups associated with Long Now continue to happen. Whether or not the result is a 10,000-year functioning timepiece is, if not irrelevant, certainly not a monopoly on why it's there. Finding like-minded people who are also optimistic about the future is the secret mission of what the Long Now Foundation is really about. And similarly, I, the angel of death, the overseer, of the endings of all, still find that even towards the end, there is a bright, beautiful future, no matter what the present assumed it was going to be. This is Jason Scott Talks His Way Out of It. Thanks to Mark Pilgrim, Emilio Oliveira, James Bekoyanu, Scott Roseanne, Scott McGrady, and Wayne Arthurton along with the hundreds of other supporters on Patreon and elsewhere who have been supporting me and helping me get out of debt. Here's to many more tea parties, many more tigers, and the endless dream and hope that it'll all work out in the end.